Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Chirolias, welcome to the Tommy Talk. My name is Juan. This is my Chikuma partner, Anthony. This is a judo podcast for judo players by two judo players. So, Anthony, how you been doing this week? I just saw you yesterday. Uh, yeah, I just saw you yesterday at dojo. Um, <laughs> feels good to do judo. I'm noticing a, some of my flab around my body is like disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, it's funny I'm because if you so look at our video, now. not videos, but you look at our photos I posted of us, it looks like we're doing just judo out on the concrete. People don't notice that we're actually doing it on a crash pad. <laughs> Really? So I had but, some people <laughs> has people message me be like, are you guys just throwing on the asphalt? It's like, um Well technically kind of, that was true really. for me. I got thrown on the asphalt. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. You got thrown on the asphalt one time and then you tried to work on a fancy Koga style throw <laughs> and throw your shoulder <laughs> into my face. <laughs> well my I thought my knee would be able to support it, but I guess it's not as strong post surgery as I thought it would I used to be able to do it, the Koga style thing. Um, yeah. That yeah. which we're going to talk about the Koga style so and not get, but mm-hmm. my leg just kind of gave up, gave out, and I didn't want you to fall on the concrete. <laughs> so I forced the throw, and of course, I drove my shoulder into your chest cavity. It, no, it's funny because when you're doing it, I'm like, too high, too high, too high. <laughs> <laughs> lower, lower, too high. Oh, I'm hey, hey, I had your well being <laughs> in mind all the time. So. Well, like we were talking about, there was actually two big passings in judo this past month. Mm-hmm. Um, back on March 22nd, here in America, there was a big judo passing, especially in Southern California. Uh, Sensei Hell Sharp passed away. And then a few days after that on March, was it March 24th, the great Koga passed away. So in about a week, we lost two really good players. Uh, the first person I want to talk about is talk about Hell Sharp. Um, here in America, he's kind of a big name because he's one of the few American players that, that was a real, well, technically when he passed away, he was a real 10th Don. Um, I actually mm-hmm. trained with him one time at a, at a seminar. He came to our dojo. But just so people know who he is, because trust me, you probably read his books, watched one of his movies, or you've seen a judo photo from the back of the 1940s to 60s. Mm-hmm. Most likely he took that photo and took that video. But um, so how Sharp passed away as a 10th Don he got his 10th Don last year in November of last year, I believe. And the books that he wrote was a uh, sport of judo, which I th- almost every dojo I've been to has that book somewhere mm-hmm. technique of judo and uh, boys judo. And then he um, kind of rewrote that later when he could boys and girls self-defense. And um, he wrote another book. Let me see if I can find it. Um, Road to black belt. That's what it was. And those are some of the big judo books. The first two they wrote, Sport of Judo and Techniques of Judo. Um, he didn't write them himself. He was always like the co-author because mm-hmm. it was a Japanese players that wanted to write a judo book and they wanted to make it popular in the world. So they had him co-author and take the photos for it. Mm-hmm. But those are some of the biggest books out there. And if you ever watched a, like a really old judo video, some of them on YouTube, he actually made, um, I'm not sure how many videos he made, but the two big ones that he made was um, classic judo techniques of legendary senseis, which if you ever see a video with old senseis in it, that's probably that video, most likely. Yeah, I haven't really watched those videos, but my the, my experience with uh, Hal Sharp has been watching the, I think I met him at a tournament briefly once. Mm-hmm. And then also, I enjoy, you know, I'm, I'm geek for judo stuff, so in <laughs> judo history. So I was looking at his... Um, interviews where he talks about how he trained in Japan and how he trained mm-hmm. under all these people, which is where I assume he got the material for the books that he talked, where he talks <laughs> about all um, the judo of these great senseis. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's, it's really interesting to be able to um, basically pick his brain in sort of way on having mm-hmm. different experiences and training in Japan. And like you said, he, it feels like he has um contributed to judo a lot especially in the southern california scene because you everyone knows how, who hal sharp is here so yeah i remember um when philippe heard about how sharp this is when philippe was getting back into judo and stuff he heard about how sharp and he he couldn't believe that there was a ninth no he was the eighth dawn i think at the time ninth, eighth or ninth i'm not sure exactly but he couldn't believe that there was an eighth dawn in southern california i wasn't a bigger deal like he, he mm-hmm. couldn't understand like any other country, it'd be a huge deal if you had an eighth Don in your area, you know, someone you can go train and talk with. But 
it's funny, like his video of um, classic judo, I was actually one of the first judo videos I got from another sensei of mine at Hollywood was mm -hmm. um, Sensei Bobby Basaki. And his thing is that he would give you a judo book and a judo video to be like, hey, this is judo. You should watch this if you're going to get into it. And I remember when I went to go visit, he gave me it and I watched it. And I was like, you know, it, it was just seeing these really cool old videos of these old techniques, these old senses that you can't find. They're really hard to find. I remember them saying that he actually donated a bunch of those videos, well, the actual originals to the Kodokan to put in their library. So that yeah, cool. that's this Kodokan library. I, maybe someone who listens can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, when I visited Japan, um, it's kind of like a museum and the library, they have like this little room where they stored all like the artifacts and mm -hmm. behind glass. You can't take photos, but then I know there's also books oh. there. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd want to, if I learn to read Japanese, I really want to, which I am doing, I, I want to go there and start <laughs> reading these books, but I don't know if they give mm -hmm. everyone access to it, whether you have to know someone, get yeah. have connections and kind of stuff, but that's well, really interesting. You'd be a minimum black belt. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's but, sad um, that uh, we, we lost uh, Hal yeah. Sharp Sensei this uh, past yeah. month. Yeah, it was really like you were saying, he's always he was always nice when I met him. He was always nice, kind, had a smile on his face. Uh, the one time he did have a clinic at Hollywood Judo, there are some funny stories he told us. Like, I'll, I think I'll tell me two of the funny stories he told me. But one thing that I took from him and I teach it to white belts always, this kind of funny thing, is his counter to Osotogari. And his thing was like, everybody when they first learned Judo does Osotogari. Everyone does Osotogari. And I don't know why I didn't think of this myself, but he had a counter of doing Osotogari. When they come for Osoto, you go in for Ippon Sonagi when they do it. And it's one of those techniques like, okay. that's so simple. Why didn't I think about that? And I remember he taught, that was like one of the main techniques I was teaching mm -hmm. that day. And I was like, that's great. And I now teach that to all the kids because kids, that's all they do. All kids do, they yeah. jump in and do Osotogari and Osoto, hop Osoto, around. Osoto, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so then you tell them, like, Ippon Sonagi. And they're like, oh, okay. And they do it. <laughs> but yeah, like one of the funniest stories they told me is that, well, he told it a class that was all there was that one time he was at the Kodokan and I can't remember for the life of me, which black belt he was facing, but he was there and there was this big black belt there, big famous black belt that no one could throw, no one could do nothing. And he decided, okay, I'm going to go face him. And I guess the Kodokan, like you've been there, they have springs yep. underneath the mats. So they have springs. Did they always, they have, back, even back then? Because I, I, those springs feel kind of new, but um, maybe well, they had it back it then It might too, be yeah. like, this could have been, this might have been, because he was in Japan, like from the fifth, like the forties, fifties, sixties. So it could have been the sixties uh -huh. even when this happened. So it could have been brand new springs, who knows? Yeah. But he was saying that, yeah, there was, I can't remember what the black belt's name is. I feel so stupid because someone's going to remember and be like, oh, dumb one, it was this guy. And I'm like, I didn't know. <laughs> But he said, yeah, so I went up against him, fought as hard as I could, threw him, made a big crash, this big sound. Everyone was like, oh, got up. <laughs> yeah. I was like, thank you, sir. I am done. And he walked away. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how, what, whether he trained at the main floor at the time, the seventh, seventh floor, because there, there's like the main floor with the observer deck. And that's where the the nightly randori goes on um mm -hmm. but then there's also like closed off to the visitors kind of upper level for classes and kind of stuff um i don't see that happening in the, like imagine if i went against <laughs> you in randori and i was just like i threw you and like, okay i'm not done i'm done like <laughs> <laughs> no you run away, you I run away. i'm good oh i, I gotta go ah, i need your restroom real quick <laughs> sorry <laughs> no but that that's really impressive and um when you throw someone big, you'll definitely feel it because all the spring with someone the springs are all connected, the whole floor, the whole mm. subfloor. So when someone on the other side of the mat gets thrown, you feel it like the whole floor shakes. <laughs> but they, it makes it really um nice to be thrown on. And one of the guys that I trained with actually drove me through the floor and I was like ready for the impact, but I it didn't hurt that much actually. So uh -huh. Yeah. Another funny thing is like um I can't, like, you guys don't know who Ramiro Mateo are, but the two of our friends at Judo, big, really big Brazilian redwood tree guys. <laughs> and they're just hard to throw. And I remember um, how Sharp was watching me do Rondori with them. He's like, 
why aren't you throwing them around? They're only brown belts. Throw them around. I was like, sir, you do not know how hard to throw these guys. They're grip fighting. <laughs> I'm like, game Here, on sir, point. Yeah. would you like to please throw one of these and sh- show me, teach me, please? <laughs> <laughs> but how old was he at the time when he had the clinic? How old was he? Like, yeah. I'm thinking this had to be at least 10 years ago. 10 years ago. If, okay. It's between. Eight to 10 years ago is when we had the clinic, I think. Actually, he's the one, if you ever visit our dojo and you see in the corner, there's the belt rankings of all mm-hmm. the colors. He donated that. He donated that to us. I was like a gift to him, from him to us was that. And it was supposed to be a big thing about. I really UCF like that. From UCF, that diagram, supposed, yeah. yeah. The diagram they have his back is great. You know, the pictures and everything. And it's because that there was supposed to be, um, they're going to try to condense and try to figure out like which techniques you should teach for each belt rank. And that's yep. what he was passing around and giving people. And that's how we got it. And we still use it to this day. We still go off that that chart still. Because it's a great chart. The kids love it. Like they see it. And they're like, <laughs> oh, I need to do this. They always go over and look at the, the pictures and what they need to do to get the next rank. And yeah, it's, uh, it's an awesome contribution. Mm-hmm. So is there anything, any stories that you know that you want to tell them about them? No, everything I've heard about um, Hal Sharp has been through you guys. And also, like, I know um, Rhonda and a lot of big judo figures, like, trained under him or see him as a mentor kind of thing. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm, his contribution has been great. And, I mean, a lot of people just kind of brush off, like, for many, not just judo, for many martial arts, they see, like, oh, he's eighth don, tenth don, probably just, like, got the belt for being in that grade for a long time. But I feel like, um, in in this case, in judo's case, mostly, I think a lot of the s- senseis that get that high in the Don rank, they've been contributing in judo for a long time. And it's like a really well-deserved, uh, rank and a symbol that, um, of what they've done for judo in their, whether it's local community or internationally or nationally. Um, yeah. So that's, that's what I think. Yeah, like I said, he he wrote three of the biggest books in judo. Like almost every dojo I've been to always has sport of judo. Like that's like one of the main judo books you'll find anywhere. And the thing is that most people don't even realize that he wrote it. They're, like I said, there's so many stuff that you've probably seen and looked at that Mr. Sharp did that you wouldn't even know. But yeah, we only had one clinic with them. We wanted to have more, but it never happened. And now that he passed. Kids nowadays don't read books. <laughs> well, we don't read books we gotta this. like we gotta put it in inside Fortnite or something or like put, put it up on tiktok and instagram a judo dance in Fortnite. that's what they should do <laughs> just ipon sonagis yeah so that's the big american in that passed away it's the big loss to us it's very sad but it is what it is and internationally we did have a big loss also the great koga passed away now uh Koga passed away. Apparently he had cancer. Uh, he had surgery last year. Yeah, they haven't kidney. really confirmed. They, they, they confirmed he had surgery for cancer last year, but they didn't confirm what he died from. Right. Well, so, uh, I don't know. This guy's conspiracy assume. theories right here. This guy. Right no, here. All right. I, I just don't want to spread misinformation <laughs> that he died from cancer well, when well, all we know is he had, had cancer. Gone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the really cool thing about Koga well, not a really cool thing. He had great things, but he was great at Ipon Sonagi. That was a master of it. And he has the Koga Sonagi that everyone should imitate. But um, so Koga was, um, he was a eighth Don in Judo, but it's kind of funny. The day before he passed, he got his ninth Don in Judo from the Kodokan. So they kind of knew something was going on with him. Very sad, but he passed away as a ninth Don. His big accomplishments is that he got gold at the, was it? Uh, 92 Olympics in Barcelona, mm-hmm. Barcelona. Which is awesome. And then the next Olympics after that in Atlanta, where he went up a weight class, where he was fighting at 78 kilograms, he got silver. And mm-hmm. if you ever watch that match, that match is crazy because the French guy that beat him just beat him because he was moving so much. He was just moving. Yeah. He did not stop. <laughs> like, have you seen that match, Anthony? I've watched it briefly, but I honestly, uh, I, I can't remember the details because I just watched like so many of Koga's matches and. I, honestly, for me, I I really liked watching the All Japan Judo Championships clips of Koga because mm-hmm. he's mm-hmm. fighting these huge big guys, and he still beats them somehow. <laughs> so <laughs> you're you're just kind of like astounded by it. Um, mm-hmm. 
and that's that's my memory of um most of Koga's matches. Yeah. Well, Koga was also besides being an Olympic champion, he was um three time world champion, twice at seventy one kilos and once at seventy eight kilos. So three time world champion, one time Olympic champion. Um, everybody knows a story about how he injured his knee by Yoshida was doing Rondori with him, injured his knee, and then he had to change up how he did his Ippon Seonagi because of that. And that's how we came up with the, was it the one arm Seonagi? <laughs> yeah, I think that was one of the reasons. Um, he, he, for what I read, he learned his, uh, so people call it Koga Seonagi now, but some people also used to uh, refer it to as the hip split. So and I get, and I've also heard people call it lunge because it's like a lunge position. Mm-hmm. Um, he learned it from his brother, is what I heard. Uh, when okay. he was, whenever he, it seemed like whenever he lost or got injured and found like he hit a wall of some sort, he always found a, w- a way around his injury, his limitations. Like for a long time, he was, I think he was struggling with fighting lefties. Mm-hmm. So he started doing like Tomoe Nage, started working on his uh, Kochi. And all these other things, just to, just to, it, it, sorry, something just popped in my head about a conversation we had. But he just found ways around it. And um, I know we were talking about watching the Grand Slam yesterday mm-hmm. when we were at judo. Yeah, and we we're talking about the Klimkade versus uh, Taguchi match, mm-hmm. and how she was just spamming drop seoi like yeah. over and over and over again, and she's lost to. Degushi like five or six times already. <laughs> okay. So why if you take a page from Koga's book, when you, you you hit a limitation, you're losing to all these lefties, you're losing the same player over and over again. He reinvented himself, found ways around doing stuff. And mm-hmm. um even though you'll see a lot of people trying to emulate Koga say and again, I don't think everyone's successful like he was. Right. Oh, so, no, no. He yeah. So I, I don't think people should take it. it as, yeah, this guy did something that's uh, a new way of doing something that's better, but it, he made it work for him. So you should kind of like use, see this as a tool and make that work for you too. So, mm-hmm. yeah, because it's just the way he would come into his Sayonogs was just totally different than everybody. He came in with that, like, um, mm-hmm. The only way you describe the legs, I guess, is kind of like in a running stance because you'd come in with your back leg, not right next to your leg, but he would come in with the back leg. Yeah, I think it's, it's the like a leg. lunge. It's like a lunge. Yeah, like yeah, like a lunge, yeah. like a, like you're yeah, like you're doing a total lunge on the guy. A reverse lunge, I guess. Like you're you're instead of lunging forward, you lunge backwards. <laughs> yeah, or if you do fencing, like a fencing lunge, also I guess you call it. Yeah. But he would do it also from like a same side grip, so he wouldn't be holding the cross. He wouldn't holding the cross to be the same side, so he's mm-hmm. same side he's holding the the gi on the sleeves he's holding the same side of the collar and he would all come with, with his arm almost like he's doing a morote seonagi yeah. mm-hmm. really deep to pull a guy over and it's just once he got you in that he just seen like he picks people up they just squirm 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 and they could not get out of it and just throw the guy i think and he oh sorry go ahead no, no, I was just saying, and he also kind of, not invented, but he did use a lot of it in the old school that he would finish the sweep with his hand also yep. for certain throws. Yeah, so like I said, I don't think the Koga style sailing and I get was anything new. I'm sure other, because he learned, first, he learned it from his brother, and second, mm-hmm. I, I'm pretty sure I've seen other people do it, but I think he was the one, again, who made it work for him, like, and made it super successful and put it on, like, the world stage. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, and all, one other thing is, I think he popularized the um, the armpit grip that you mm-hmm. people attribute to Shohei Ono now, who uses the armpit mm-hmm. grip. And before yeah. that, I think uh, Kosei Inoue also used that armpit grip a lot for Uchimata and uh, Osoto and all that stuff. But that armpit grip is super powerful, and um, you know Charles from our dojo, Black Belt. I've never, no, no, I was I that a Charles guy. <laughs> I don't know John Charles guy. What are you talking about? I struggle to throw him for like a year and the only throw I've ever gotten on him like during mm-hmm. our competition practice on Saturday was off of that armpit grip Hanegoshi like okay that armpit grip was something that I learned from Koga even though I've seen Shoya Ono do it but I watched Koga mm-hmm. do it and I tried it out and then I just sent Charles flying and that was the only time I ever threw him. <laughs> so and then you said thank you very much and then you left the mat <laughs> <laughs> no, he, it's funny because just, yeah no, no, it's funny because the person that I actually do the, not do it from, but who's a big advocate as is Sensei Gary, the head sensei of our dojo would always talk mm-hmm. about stuff like that. Like he was always about like grabbing the arm, had to pull a guy in tight. Yep. 
Right. Yeah. So yeah, after it, go, it goes to show, yeah, it goes to show like no, there's just really nothing new and whether it's judo, jujitsu or whatever, like it's just people discovering it. it. Yeah. And popularize it. But definitely I think people, instead of focusing on the techniques that Koga popularized, they should focus more on his innovation and his, um, principles of never, yeah. Ne- never giving up basically. Right. Mm-hmm. Messed up his knee. Let me do, go readjust and make this technique work for me. You know? Yeah. And I can relate to that is. with a messed up knee. So <laughs> you hurt yourself one way. It's all right. I hurt my left side. I'm gonna do my right side. You know, that's exactly how it is. Like you hurt your left knee. Okay. Everything's in front of the right side now. Okay. Yep. Oh, I can't lift up on one leg. Oh, I'm doing all double leg lifts now. It's just, this is how it is. You have to adapt, change and do things that mm-hmm. do things, I guess that way. But yeah, after Koga retired, he became the head of the women's uh, team. He became the head coach of the women's team, right? And he had um, mm-hmm. some a bunch of his players did well after that. They he won the one gold medal, I think. Yeah, yeah. There's one I can't remember her name. Uh, Ayumi Tanimoto. She mm-hmm. won the gold medal in 63 kilograms in 2004 Summer Olympics in Athens. Okay. Yep. And then after that, he went to just coach uh, college judo. After that, I believe. Yeah, International Pacific University. It's in Okayama. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, funny. Every time I hear Okayama, I always think of Okayama Kaigen Roll. You see a restaurant in, in yeah. Little Tokyo named that. So I always think of that place. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, I also read that he, at, when he was in uh, when he was forty, he went back to school and he got he actually has a medical degree. Oh. So that that's what I read. I haven't. What kind of medical degree? I don't know. It's just what I read. So, He's got the doctorate. <laughs> I don't know cool. how the medical degrees work in Japan, but uh, yeah. we, we, every country is different. But yeah. So, is there anything else you want to talk about Koga? Talk about his Sonagi style or anything? Well, you can if you're watching on YouTube, you can <laughs> see the my background is uh his highlights <laughs> from the Grappler Kingdom uh, YouTube channel. Yeah. So, well, that's another thing about Koga. If you look up Ipon Sonagi. I'm 90% sure they're, you're going to see Koga videos or yeah. his videos are going to come up first because he was just the king of the Ponsonagi. He mm-hmm. knew how to do it so many different ways. He made it work for himself. And that's the way just, just amazing. Just watch his it. No, yeah. His no, like we, we were, we were talking about how he, uh, how he won the all Japan, right. Or the Kodokan, mm-hmm. uh, Kodokan cup where there's no weight classes. He's fighting these huge guys and just getting underneath them. He, yeah, well, most of them, if you watch it, it's not even score. It's um, he somehow just counters them or drags them to the ground with like a like a attempt at a throw. Mm-hmm. Then he gets them in Nawaza. So mm-hmm. you're just watching these huge, even though he's not like getting them with these huge throws, you're watching this huge guy fighting this tiny guy and they're playing defensive against Koga. Like you can tell Koga is dominating the match. <laughs> like he's dictating the pace and they're just defending him. Well, it's one of those things like, I don't want this little guy to beat me. I don't want this little guy to throw me. Like, no one wants to be that guy to lose to him. <laughs> yeah, so... But it's going to yeah, happen. So it's going to come. If you, if you can't beat them on the stand-up, he was doing, beating them in Nawaza, too. So, goes yeah, back to what great we were player. saying. Yeah. Great player. Amazing guy. And if you ever do watch, because um, it's up on YouTube. I was watching, actually, a month ago before this happened. It was kind of sad. I was watching stuff. And when he fights a French guy... The French guy just doesn't stop moving because Koga just couldn't set up anything. He would try to grab him, try to attempt stuff. And the Frenchman would just move around the entire time. And he went to, um, back then they didn't have golden score. They had the old school flags. Yeah. Which, um, not this so. is the judge's referee's decision on who was yeah. more aggressive. Yeah. Since the French guy was moving more and just, I don't think he was really attempting more. I think Koga was attempting more personally mm-hmm. to get to the French guy. And that's how Koga got silver. But can you just imagine that you're moving up a weight class? Was that the one where he hurt his knee and he had to fight in painkillers? Was that one? Yeah, I think it was that one because he moved up in weight class. You know, remember he got his gold medal and his two world championships at 71 kilos. Then he moves up a weight class to go to 78. Mm -hmm. That's just amazing. Because you think think of that, you got close to getting like he did have two like three world championships, two different weight classes. But you imagine two gold medals in two different weight classes. Yeah, that's nice. Like we were talking about, imagine. uh, two gold medals this year for the Olympics and then the world championships <laughs> after. 
That's another thing that's going to happen. Hey, go Johnny. Johnny, I know you're listening. Go there, Johnny. <laughs> Yeah, I don't All know. Right. He's he had some family thing happen, and I think the Aww. the grand the grand slam that just happened uh, this last weekend was his last. I think it was his last chance before. Maybe there's one more chance mm-hmm. um, before he has to get rack up the point, the one win he needs to go to Olympics. But I'll ask him. But, it's one win. It's one win, baby. That's all you need. One win. <laughs> Man, so watching my background, it's just beautiful throws. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of somber news or sadder news about judo. We lost two judo legends this last month. It's very really sad. Uh, there's some other kind of sad news in judo that happened. So this kind of thing that you brought up, you showed it to me. A lot of other people sent to me also mm-hmm. was that this past weekend at the Turkey Grand Prix. What's the name? Mm-hmm. What name was the city that they're in? Talia. Talia, the Talia Antal- Grand Prix. Antalya. Antalya? Antalya. Yeah. All right. So at the Antalya Grand Prix in Turkey, mm-hmm. there was a match between a Spanish woman and... Um, Swedish, oh, I think. So was, was it, it a Swedish it or Danish? Netherlands? Or Netherlands. Dan- Netherlands, yeah. yeah. Netherlands, yeah. So she's yeah. from the Netherlands. Danish. Yep. Yes. Are we talking about no, food? No, Danish is hungry? Denmark. Sorry. Are you hungry? Uh, wait, so you I'm thinking eat? Dutch. I'm always... <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm hungry. So Dutch. that's Anthony right there at <laughs> Dutch. <laughs> Dutch. Okay, so Dutch. yeah. So in their match, the Spanish girl was coming in for what looked like um Uchimata. Uh, she attempted Uchimata, then came out, and then she's trying to attempt it again, it looked like. And it looked the, like she hooked her she hooked her leg to prevent um being Uranage, it looked like at first, I think. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's judge's call and how you see mm-hmm. it, but what happened at the end is DQ no matter what. So yeah. in the second attempt, I thought that she was attempting a second throw. Anthony thinks that she was blocking for the Udenage. Either way. Oh, no, that was before leg- the second. That was before. I was sorry. She put her leg in between her feet to prevent Udenage. And then afterwards, she goes to attempt a second throw, like you said. So, yeah. And in that second throw, she loses balance and gets her foot stuck behind the girl, behind the woman. And says, "Screw it!" and goes for cut. It goes for uh, Kai Basami. <laughs> and you just see this woman's leg, the, oh, the one from the Netherlands. You just see her knee just collapse. You just see like all her weight just falls down on it. Her ankles underneath her. You see her knees down. And to me, it's like, ah, it's okay. I've seen worse. That's Anthony's like, ah, my knee. No, oh no, that, that's, that's a career-changing injury. Um, whether it's ending or not, it's debatable, but it's going to totally affect the way you fight in the future. Definitely. Yeah. So the Spanish woman ended up doing Kambasami and all judo players know, all of us international judo players, tournament judo players, we all know that that's illegal technique in judo now. That is just a blatant, straight out illegal technique. That isn't like a warning or you messed up. That mm-hmm. is just illegal. And the thing to me is that when she did it, it's me like it was just like, uh, fuck it. Like she just went, went for it. Like it was kind of like an act, like she was there and just like, oh, well, I'm just going to fall down. She didn't, whether she meant to or not, she still attempt, she still did it. Yep. So some people were saying that, oh, it was an accident. Oh, she slipped. And I was like, no, nah. it looked to me like she was just like, oh, well, I'm here. So it doesn't fuck matter. It. Yeah. She, well, that's not what it seemed like to me, but in yeah. the heat of the moment, things happen, you know, and I blame it on the training personally. Um, mm-hmm. It was just, the way that high level competition judo does the training, you see, you, you can you see how they dive head first and they, the, even though at a local level, they'll not allow that to happen. They'll give you a shido for diving head diving in your throws, but in international level, people get concussions like from head diving into throws and they still let them win with it <laughs> when they should be punished. Yeah. But well, we, that's, that's we're, we're training. Yeah, they're trained to fully commit into the throw. So then yeah. that whole mindset causes things like this to happen because there's no lack of control, I think. Well, there's a thing I always say to people is that in judo, ippon means everything. And if you get an ippon from the throw, whether it was an illegal, you did a bad technique, or you almost concuss the person, if you get ippon, ippon stands. That's just well, one that, of the weird things. That's, you, that's you the thing. That it's, not just, it's not just ippon. It's anything with your ass touching the floor now is wasari almost. <laughs> so it pays off to get that desperate and commit fully to it. Cause then you get this sloppy throw. And if someone they, magically their elbow or their side touches, touches the floor, even if it's like a shitty throw, 
they still get a score for it. So it's incentivizing these people to do these lack of control, just brute force, ugly throws. Let's be honest. They're like ugly. Mm. Well, okay. Well, let's first explain to people that's not about this right now. Some of our listeners might not know what uh, kind of Asami is. It's that, so it's a leg scissors. Mm-hmm. If you ever watch a Taekwondo video, standout video, sometimes BJJ, they do it as well. It's just a leg scissors technique. Now, the reason in judo, why it's illegal is that it's a high percentage move that you're going to hurt your opponent, that you're going to hurt their knee, you're going to mess up their, they're going to break their knee, their, their uh, shin bone, or even their uh, thigh bone even. Um, the big reason that it's illegal, fully illegal, is that a long time ago, during a long, long time ago, <laughs> in, a foreign ga- in a galaxy far away, <laughs> but a long time ago, um, what was his name? Yamashita. Yamashita, yes. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm trying to figure out who he was fighting. Who was fighting? Endo. So there was two Japanese rivals. There were a hundred plus. There were uh, what was that time? It was um, ninety five plus kilos yep. guys. Okay, big boys, big boys. I'm talking about little guys, big boys here. They're fighting in a match. Um, Endo went for Kambasami, and he just just it's sideways. It wasn't a back snap. one. Yeah, it's just. Oh my God, if you watch it like that looks bad because when you do it, you're supposed to go backwards. When you taught this move, you're supposed to go backwards with the person. Mm -hmm. But when Endo did it, he went sideways into him. You heard a snap, his his knee was broken, right? I think it was his uh, shin femur, shin bone, I can't remember. All right, either way, it was a big snap. Anthony's uncle up right now. I'm looking it up, but it's a fibula, yeah. The fibula, okay. His fibula got broken. That's a shin bone, yeah. Yeah. And ever since then, it's just been illegal in competition, any judo competition, local, state, national, international Olympics. It is just an illegal move. Some people say that, oh, well, it's just because he's such a big player. That's why he got, no, it's just, it's because it hurts people. More times than not, you're going to hurt the person doing it. You shouldn't do it in competition. And my theory on why judo players end up hurting themselves doing this is that in judo, we're trying not to fall on our backs. So we are fighting with everything we got to stay standing. So when people go for this throw and you're gonna fight, you're gonna put your legs to the ground really hard. You're gonna try to stand up and so it's forcing you backwards. You're gonna mess up your knee. You're gonna mess up your ankle. And that's what happens. What do you think about it, Anthony? Yeah, I think I totally agree with you. Um, Cause we see this used in, like you said, Sanda and, and like uh, Kongli, is famous for well that's his bread and butter move yep, and you yep. see it in some other uh, mma um not ufc but in some other mma promotions you see it happen um but i think it's a you don't see it happen often because it's a high risk high reward kind of technique if you don't get it then the person's right on top of you and he's going to beat the crap mm-hmm. out of you um but bjj i think nowadays a lot of local smaller tournaments ban it but um, a few years ago, I actually see it happen a lot. Like I watched mm-hmm. some of the BJJ um, tournaments online and it's not just big people. I've seen little girls just like snap other people's knees with this technique and it's taught mm-hmm. in, in, like it's not incorrectly. That's just, I, I don't want to go into <laughs> details about BJJ teaching stand up, but it's taught incorrectly and people just snap the knee and they, they win. <laughs> like, well, what am I, what, what my other theories about why it's so bad in judo and in grappling too, like BJJ, yeah. is because we're fighting to stay standing up the entire time. Mm-hmm. When you do it in a Taekwondo tournament or a standout tournament or any other stand up like kickboxing stuff, if you fall to the ground, it's fine. I'm not losing a point. I'm not losing a match. You know, I'm not going to get, a, I'm not going to get a 10 count for it. They're going to count it as a sweep and you stand back up. But in grappling, we're trying to stay standing. We're not going to their backs. We don't want to go to the mats where we don't want to be at. And that's when you hurt somebody. Yeah. And one of the problems with, again, this match, and I kind of feel bad because I'm going to bring this up about a, had to be over a year ago now because of COVID. I actually did this to a BJ guy and I thought I messed up his, his leg for a second <laughs> because I went for, con- it was right there. I was like, oh, I'm going to go for Kanye Basami, right? It's right here. Why not? I'm just going to go for it. And he stepped over my leg right when I was going to do it. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> you can't stop it. <laughs> yeah. I'm in the air already. And he steps over <laughs> my foot. And that's when people most get hurt in my opinion. When the foot is in between the legs, so your leg lacing them and you're trying to do kambasami, now you're doing all that weight on one leg. That's what happened to me. Yeah. 
Yeah. The, if you do compass on me correctly, it's supposed to be the body and the back of both legs. But if you're doing all that weight to just one leg, yeah, it's going to snap. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened with the Spanish woman is that she had her leg laced inside and was like, fuck it. I'm going to go for it. And just put all that weight. Her, Cause think about it. It's your entire body weight plus majority of your opponent's weight all on their knee, mm -hmm. ankle, tibia, fibia, hip, whatever, all right there. Like what's yep. going to give, what's going to give right there. The bones, that's what's going to give. <laughs> Yeah. So my I, one thing I was think, thinking about was um, you don't see it as often in MMA. I think since we we're talking about it, and mm -hmm. um, in in some sense, jujitsu because of their they tend to have to be have a wider, narrower stance um, mm -hmm. versus judo and sanda and Muay Thai, like Muay, whatever striking art. They tend to have a more upright, uh, smaller. Uh, the legs aren't spread apart. The, yeah. yeah, the legs aren't as, as spread as part. When your legs are so spread apart and in a narrower stance, it's hard to get to the side and do that to your opponent. So that's one reason I think it's uh, more rare to see that happening. Um, but I think with a more higher center of gravity where it's like strike, like Muay Thai has a high guard stance and stuff like that, then you'd probably be able to see those if the takedowns were allowed in, in that stance. Mm -hmm. But... Um, yeah, it's, uh, people should just not do it. Like I've been, I'm actually seeing a lot of people on Facebook and Instagram posting Kani Basami clips. Like, un, not not trained uh, people, but people who have mm -hmm. never done martial arts. They're like, "Oh, this is so cool!" Like, it and, looks cool. Yeah, Kani Basami <laughs> looks awesome. Hey, I think they did it in John Wick too. I think it's like Kani yeah. Basami looks amazing. It looks so beautiful. And like you say, Kung Lee. Like I'm from the Bay Area. Most people know mm -hmm. that I'm from the Bay, San Jose all day. So in the Bay, if you did, if you're going to become a kickboxer, most likely you did Sandow or Sandow, however you want to say Sandow, it and stuff. Yep. Sandow. <laughs> <laughs> but because that, the big guys in the Bay Area was you watch Kung Lee fight or you watch mm -hmm. Rudy Ott fight. Those are two big Sandow guys back out there. And Kung Lee was one of his main moves. He would just like kick guys, roundhouse kicks, boom, go into that sweep right there, just sweeping guys to the ground. And sometimes you would like hit him a little afterwards and stuff, but it's this beautiful move. So everyone in the Bay, like we all know it stuff, but it's, I think it, like, when you're standing up, it is much more easier to sweep somebody off their legs because they don't mind falling, but in judo or jujitsu or something else, even, even in Sambo, cause they do a lot of Sambo videos. We're all trying not to fall. We're all going to try our hardest, especially at a tournament. We're all trying not to fall. I think also in judo, you have the gi and everything. So, mm -hmm. um, even without the gi, uh, you tend to be grabbing hold of your opponent. And John Danaher explains, uh, he, he banned Connie Basami and Tanya Toshi from his, his club in New York. Mm -hmm. And he explains to you, most of the injuries happen when you're using your body weight to drag someone down essentially. Mm -hmm. And I think with the gi, you're holding on most, that's what happened to my knee too. Someone held on to me and I couldn't escape and it just like snapped my knee. Right. No, it can you explain to our audience what happened to your knee exactly? Because we talk, we kind of talk B, about vague terms. Okay. A BJJ black belt came in to our randori <laughs> session, tried to do Tani Otoshi, but he ended up doing the Kani Basami that was seen in the, the video we're talking about, basically, mm -hmm. because he, his leg got stuck and laced in between my two legs. And he basically aerial knee barred me. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> like, so. <laughs> but in the air. And <laughs> he, 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 uh, he fell down and basically dragged me down. My knee just like snapped basically. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, going, going back to what I was saying, um, well, what was I saying? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were talking about how you got your knee snapped by a BJJ guy. And just, the oh yeah. Like, so, so without the gi, like we're talking about striking, you have gloves on you most of the time. Right. So you're mm -hmm. not holding on to your opponent and like dragging them down with your weight. So I think that's another reason why you don't see it. Injuries like that happen as often in striking arts when that, that hap what that occurs. Mm -hmm. Like in this case, if you go back to the video and watch it um, to the grand slam clip, we're talking about they're, they're like all holding up tangled together and the other person is yeah. trying to counter so she's holding on to her and when there's that much weight going on then that's the, when the risk of injury gets higher well so it's like what we said that it is a backwards going technique and i don't think enough people understand that you have to go backwards a lot of people think that's just a collapsing technique 
or it's a sideways technique, which mm -hmm. is not, it is not a sideways technique. Never do you go sideways mm -hmm. on it. Um, that's how uh, Yamashite actually broke. Like I said, if you watch that video, he came yep. in sideways on him. And it's just like, it, that's that's tough to watch. It's like- you're, it's, one, one, one other thing that people miss is that you're supposed to be holding up your weight with your arm, kind of like doing a breakdancing freeze move. So you're supposed yeah. to have one arm down, holding up your weight as you scissor the person down. But some people just like, like we talked about already, hold on to the other person while they're doing it, or they just mm -hmm. jump up and don't really support their own weight and use the body weight to snap them down. So no, because that doesn't look as cool. When I have one hand yeah. down, I'm scissoring person. That doesn't look cool. But if I just come in, just snap the legs like that, it looks amazing. Yeah, it's just yeah, it's reminds just, me of it's a, what you know the the wushu movies where they like jump up and then scissor like take the scissor they scissor the neck and then they swing around them and take them down like it reminds me yeah. of that basically <laughs> but it's you need to watch a little bit more pro wrestling you'll understand that better <laughs> <laughs> so yeah those are kind of the big things that happened these past few weeks we had two passings mm -hmm. in in judo two big passings and then we had this really bad dis disgusting mm -hmm. move happen um oh, before we move on like um yeah what do you think about people especially this is what i hear from a lot of people on the bjj subreddit is that when you go to a competition this is what you signed up for the risk of injury do you, if the rules do allow it do you like what do you think like do, do you think they sh the rules should be removed or like whether it's fair that oh you signed up for a competition so you know what you're signing up for kind of thing I get that. I totally understand that. But I think it's funny that BJJ is the one saying that that's what you signed up for when they're the ones that do the most restrictive stuff. If I mm -hmm. suplex a guy at a judo tournament, like there's a video that was going around I told you about also, yeah. where a guy gives a guy a perfect suplex, he gets DQ'd. You know, it's like, well, you signed up for a grappling match. Isn't that what you expected? Well, yeah. Um, I get it. We're all taking risks. When we go on the mat, whether it's Rondori or a tournament, we are all taking risks. Okay. It's about mm -hmm. that you have to feel safe with your partner. And I understand that at a IGF tournament, international, a big international tournament like this, you want to get your points. You want to go to Olympics. You want to do well. So I get that kind of, you sign, you know what you're getting yourself into. Mm -hmm. You understand the danger of it. I totally get that. I totally understand it. But then I don't like how people complain about, Oh, well, they make it too safe or like, um, Oh, they take out too many moves or only taking out stuff that's super dangerous. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's like the rules. We'll talk about this later. I think we're going to do an episode about all like illegal moves later, mm -hmm. about why they're illegal. And like one of the big things that people get mad about nowadays, like why is no leg grabbing in judo? Well, because it got sloppy. The IGF didn't like how it was starting to look like wrestling. It looked sloppy. Mm -hmm. Why do we have it in there? So to make sure we do the dynamic big throws in judo, we got to take TV out the leg grabs. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just wanted no, to it, on it. it. No, it's just that we all do stuff that's mm -hmm. when you sign up for judo, we sign up for to go to a tournament, whether it's whatever kind of tournament you go to, there's always going to be a risk of you getting hurt. Yep. That's just how it is. I just think in the end, uh, no, nobody really teaches these moves, even when it was legal and mm -hmm. it should be taught properly at the very minimum, whether it's legal or not, it should be taught. Um, just like Tani Otoshi, nobody really teaches it properly mm -hmm. everyone most people teach it incorrectly so well i think that most people just see it and they try to imitate it mm -hmm. or they just figure out like oh if i stand behind him like this i can trip him by my leg and we have a member of our dojo that just will just how do i put it he'll lock people's legs when he goes for it and then people get hurt and get mad at yeah. him he doesn't understand why well we 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 had a, uh, actually, yeah, let's not talk about it here. <laughs> I was going to say something about that person, but it'll be make it really obvious who we're talking about. So yeah. it's just, um, you got to train safe. And I understand about how senseis want to teach the moves that are going to get the wins. And that's why, like me personally, we talked about before, I like teaching different techniques sometimes. I do leg grab days. Okay. I do kataguruma days where I teach kataguruma like three or four different ways for fun. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't do it anymore. But it's what they say at the IGF, at the IGF, at the USA Nationals every year. So it's like, even though you can't do these in competition, it is still part of the curriculum. You still, the curriculum, still part of the curriculum and you should still teach it. Yeah. But a lot of sense, they don't. A lot of sense, it's just like throw off. Like what, what's that throw that you like, um, the leg one that the leg grab you like doing? Tegaruma. Um, Tegaruma. Okay. Yeah. Tegaruma is actually, I learned the other day 
well, not the other day, last year when I was looking it up, <laughs> Tegrin was actually classified as a variation of um, Sukuenage. Mm-hmm. I can see so, it. Uh, to back up a little bit, we had a little bit of feedback from Michelle from our dojo who listens to our podcast apparently. Mm-hmm. She's like, as a beginner, I don't know what the hell you guys are talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's so, told me before that when we start talking, okay. like we start talking a different language to her. <laughs> I, I might, ha- I might start looking into how to add notes onto, like, on top of the video, maybe. But mm-hmm. um, I know, like, people who th- most of our people, our listeners, are actually on the audio platform, not the, the mm-hmm. YouTube. So uh, maybe we'll just like start explaining a little bit. So the back, the backup. Kani Basami is a scissor takedown. We already mentioned that. Yes. Tani Otoshi, it's <laughs> valley drop. That's when you s- sit. S- <laughs> okay. How are you going to explain it? After you, eat, you, you, explain sit, it? you sit down to the side <laughs> and then the person is falling backwards, essentially. But your leg is technically not supposed to touch the uke's leg. Uke is your partner. But most the reason why we say most people do it incorrectly is because they hook their legs around uke's legs and drag them down that's the most common incorrect way of doing it and another way that a lot of bjj people teach people how to do this throw is that you should block the far leg pre- prevent them from retreating which is also unsafe mm-hmm. safer but still unsafe um what what other terms that we say uh well take, let me ex- take take Ruma is the the leg grab <laughs> we grab him by the thigh lift him up and then throw them sukui nage you scooping throw you just grab them by the legs and scoop them up. Okay. Continue. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just funny <laughs> to explain the throws like that. <laughs> um, for me, just the way I explained to him, uh, um, uh, what throw was I going to talk about right now? Tanyo Toshi. Was it Tanyo Toshi that we're talking about? Tegaruma? Yeah. No, no, what my favorite Teguruma. throw was. Yeah, yeah, I know you're living at those take a room and stuff. We were talking yeah. about Tanya Toshi and how it locks people's legs up, right? Yeah, if you so, if you wrap it around them, yeah. Yeah. So when you do Tanya Toshi, the way I always like to think about it is that you're making a bench with your thigh behind the mm-hmm. person. And it's just like if you sit in a chair and you lean too far backwards, you fall backwards. Mm-hmm. So that's yep. what I was like thinking about. You're making a bench with your with your thigh right there, and you're basically just throwing them backwards from right there. And is that it is a backwards falling throw. It is not a sideways falling throw. It is not them onto you. It is straight back. And I think that's what people get confused about because they'll be fighting and they'll go too far one way or too far the other way. And I'm not putting my legs. They're, they're, th- they're, God, how do you explain this now? Their leg is not between my leg. All right. Well, Their knee should not be wrapping around my thigh in any form. Yeah. <laughs> it should Shintaro's be in front YouTube of it. channel actually has a good video about it, but oh, maybe yeah. we should start doing it because then we're, look at how much time we're wasting explaining it. So. I know, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's another thing, people. We might come up with some short form videos about little yeah. things. So if you have any questions, like I said, ask us. We have free time right now. That's what we get for not planning out our podcast episodes and we're no, just kind of like, we plan go out. Is we go on tangents about yeah. little things. <laughs> we always plan to be short. We always plan to be like, okay we're gonna be one hour this week we're gonna be one hour this week two hours later we're still here <laughs> talking <laughs> all right so like i was saying before we had some bad news that happened in judo this this past month the two past scenes we had this mm-hmm. player break their knee in judo i want to end the show with a little bit of good news in judo so this past weekend uh bellator came back after a four-month hiatus and they signed one of the really good fighters one of the really good japanese fighters from ryzen to them to fight full-time for him and is is uh kana watanabe uh, kana watanabe uh so she went into this fight with um god what was the girl's name laura laura's i think it laura's the last name stuff like that either way the judo player won the fight it was a split decision. Uh, it was two to one split decision. Lara Alejandra seems like. Lara Alejandra, that one. It was yes. a split decision, which meant that uh, Watanabe is now uh, 10, 0, and 1 in judo. I mean, judo in, in judo. MMA. <laughs> I've seen MMA judo. <laughs> so she's 10 and 0 with a one draw in MMA. She's a really good fighter. I know she's ranked top five in Bellator since started doing rankings now. She fights at flyweight. If some of you guys don't know mm-hmm. what that is, that's 125 in MMA. Um, she, there's one thing I like watching her. 
she represents judo because she goes out there and does judo. She doesn't try to strike. She doesn't like, oh, I'm a boxer now. I'm a kickboxer. No, I go out there. She grabs people. She gets them with the sotogadis, kochigadis, and she's just really good ground control to, pe to hold people down using her pins, using her niwas to hold them down, do ground and pound. So if you get a chance, look for fights. She fought in deep rising and now she's had two fights in Bellator. And I think this should be coming up as long as she keeps doing judo and doesn't fall in love with her hands or starts to be like, Oh, my kickboxer. Now she's just going to do well. I think. Were you, were you, when you watched it, did they have English uh, commentary or for Ryzen? Yeah. Uh, when I use Ryzen used to have English commentary back in the day. Yeah, I, I don't know about now. That's all I was asking. You. Now, now they have it. I don't think they've had English commentary for like over a year now, I think. Oh, wow. And I don't mind. Oh. Like, I get, I get most of what they're saying. Not all of it, but I get most. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to see if they actually give credit to judo. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, they'll say in Ryzen, they'll say judo. Like these Japanese terms, they'll say judo, yeah. newaza. They'll yell out what what throw they think okay. it is, tanyo toshi. <laughs> <laughs> and well, one good thing about Ryzen also right now, you're getting off topic, is that um, Ryzen are providing their fights and like the end of their last last two shows. They have their full fights on YouTube now, but oh, they have okay. no commentary. It is just a fight. It is the sound of a dead audience, a polite no. Japanese audience, and the fighters fighting. I'm not a fan it's, of most of the commentary anyway, so. Like what, the Japanese or the American? No, just, just an MMA in, ge just oh, just in general. MMA. Yeah, oh. just in general. I don't, like, <laughs> it's funny because um, uh, I used to watch a lot of UFC with my wife, and I would always explain to her what's happening on the ground, or like, oh, yeah, you, you notice like they're – south paul versus whatever so this is going to happen or like oh they're on the ground now they should do this and then like a couple of seconds later joe rogan would say exactly the same thing <laughs> i just said <laughs> he's gonna attack us joe rogan's saying we uh, joe so you guys talk a lot of shit about me no no joe sir we're not talking shit about you we're just no, so, commentating but, on you're not knowing judo <laughs> yeah so jessica is like oh you, you should just be a commentator like <laughs> and I, I was doing we we got the tickets to uh um, we got really cheap tickets through my old jiu-jitsu club to um watch the DJ versus Cejudo match at the Staples Center. Mm -hmm. And if you went to a live UFC fight, you, there's no commentating. You're yeah. just like sitting there and I was commentating the whole thing through my life, basically. So. <laughs> I bet you people around you loved you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's loud. Okay. no one else can hear me. So, Well, here's a little funny story. Years ago, like I want to say this is like, again, like maybe almost 10 years ago about, um, I was going to actually work for a fight network as an announcer for them. Oh. And yeah, but the fight network. It could have been Bruce like, Buffer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, see, if anyone can remember when Anderson Silva fought his first time at 205 in the UFC, it was around that time because we had a big watch along party at the owner's house at his mansion and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was going to be like, I was one of the people that hired to be a fight announcer. And what this guy was going to do is that he was going to get different shows from different places and just have like a live streaming service, kind of like how uh, Fight TV works now. Mm -hmm. But he was going to provide announcers for it. And I was hired to do that because I knew grappling and striking, but nothing came of it. We did all this work. Like uh, they set up this place. We did interviews. We did all these things and nothing came. But so there was like a little, long time ago, I almost became a fat announcer. I would be tell I would be like guys explain everything in judo terms though. They would hate me. <laughs> yeah, they, they would probably hate you. Like people like, get oh, annoyed when yeah. That's a that's a this in BJJ. Ah, that's a this in judo. Sorry. I'm calling it judo <laughs> terms. All right. <laughs> you, or you you can call all three then. I grow could. your audience that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. All right, Anthony, is there anything else you want to talk about today? No, uh you want to talk about the new cover podcast art we got? Oh, okay. Did you put it up already? I put it up, but it's going to take a while to go get um, propagated to all the platforms. But basically, we have a new cover art from our one of our senseis. That so I want to give a big thanks out there to Sensei Moss. Uh, he's one of our senseis. He moved back to Japan, but he's also a graphic artist. And I asked him, like, hey, since well, he's the one actually told me before. It's like, so why does your cover art not have any tatami and it looks like you guys do karate? <laughs> and I told him, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I had a friend. I, I had a Anthony's friend fault. do it. Yeah. <laughs> so me and Anthony are talking about it. Anthony's like, yeah, you know, I'm kind of tired of this thing also. Should we change? I'm like, no, I think it's cute. I like I like how I look very anime-ish. You know, I look very yeah. I'm very kawaii in that picture. And Anthony, <laughs> Anthony's like, no, we need to change it. So I talked to Sensei Moss. I asked him about it. He said that he would love to do it for us. 
And I'll probably use that cover to do this one and for the Instagram probably. Okay. So yeah, so we have a brand new cover. It looks amazing. Anthony thinks he looks old in it. I think he looks fine. Uh, it's just future proofing <laughs> the book cover. Right? The show. <laughs> the shows are lasting 50 years. All right. Yeah. <laughs> it's great art. If you guys don't look up, um, I'll probably put an attachment on our Instagram to go to mm-hmm. Moss's Instagram for his art. You guys can look at his stuff. He does some great work out there. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Moss, again. Really appreciate this. Mm-hmm. We should bring and, him on the show sometime. I would love to, but the time difference. He says that he can't do it because of the time difference. Okay. But we'll try. Be what time would it be in Japan right now? <laughs> uh, twelve hours. I know from New York is twelve hours exactly. So, fifteen hours, something like that. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> it's a, it's, that's the thing about doing international calls. It's tough like that. So okay. Please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, please follow us on Instagram. Please follow us on YouTube. It's at Tatami. It's at, at Tatami Talk. <laughs> Tatami Talks. Uh, you can follow me at the Jared Juan underscore on Instagram. You can follow Anthony at Anthony Throws on Instagram. You can send us messages or anything you want on the YouTube. You can email us directly at Tatami Talk at gmail.com. Anything else? No. See you guys in two weeks. Yep. All right. Two weeks. Peace out. All right. Later.